All right. And now it's my pleasure to introduce our presenter and all around amazing human, Carol Pelletier Radford. A little bit about Carol. She's the founder of Mentoring in Action, an organization dedicated to the success of novice teachers and their mentors. Before that, she was a veteran elementary school teacher and a teacher preparation leader. Carol received her doctorate from the Harvard University Graduate School of Education, where she focused her studies on mentoring and teacher leadership. She's also a certified yoga teacher, and she practices meditation and shares mindfulness strategies with educators through her online courses and website. She's the author of a number of Corwin books, including Mentoring in Action, Guiding, Sharing, and Reflecting with Novice Teachers, The First Years Matter, Becoming an Effective Teacher, and Teaching with Light. She's also the host of two podcasts, Teaching with Light and Teacher to Teacher, a brand new podcast we just launched here at Corwin. Thank you so much for being with us today, Carol, and for guiding us through this conversation on wisdom and teaching advice. We've structured today's webinar a little differently as we're going to look at how a book idea came to fruition and how that idea has resulted into a collection of experiences and advice that we can look to for inspiration, comfort, and above all else, wisdom. Tell us how that happened, Carol. Oh, Megan, you, you're starting <laughs> off with the hard questions. No. <laughs> Hi, everyone. I'm so happy to be here. I'm on the East Coast. I'm on Cape Cod. And it's dark right now. But I'm so glad to uh, be able to share my journey with you. As uh, Megan said, this book is a little different. And I, I wanted to write something that could support novice teachers, but also a book that could highlight the wisdom that experienced teachers offer to the profession. And I, I mean, the audience, I'm sure, is mixed. There's probably some new teachers there. If you're in the chat, put NT if you're a new teacher, because I love you so much for choosing this profession. And if you're an experienced teacher or veteran, or if you're K-12, higher ed, we welcome every everyone is a teacher um, working to preserve this noble profession. So I wrote this book for two reasons. One is novice teachers need guidance. As, as you heard, my work is in mentoring and novice teachers uh, want the inside information. <laughs> they want to know the magic. How do you get the students to uh, respond to you so quickly? Um, what what is it that you're doing? What's the confidence that a veteran teacher, a, a master teacher, learns over time, we need to be giving that to novice teachers earlier. So one reason is I wanted to give the playbook, the, the wisdom, the hidden wisdom that we all use to these teachers as early as possible. The second is I really wanted to make our hidden wisdom more visible because it's a solitary profession. What we do in our classroom, what I did for more than 20 years, I'm the only one that saw the results of it. My students certainly did, and maybe the parents and administration, but I knew what I was doing. So I believe in the power of teacher voices. I see this book as a mentoring guide, an influencer, a way to support well-being, and to give novices the pieces, the hidden pieces of our stories that make us successful in the classroom. So this is what happened. Uh, we thought it was going to be a book of little inspirational, like well-being, keeping novice teachers happy. Um, and we knew that was going to be impossible <laughs> because we can't be happy every moment of the day. So this daily inspiration, I was like, nobody's going to read this every day. How about if we do something like weekly wisdom when teachers are using their plan books, they're going to look at this piece of wisdom from an experienced teacher and integrate this reflection into how they're planning their week. So it, it moved in that direction. And I had to think of some questions for these experienced teachers to frame the book. 
So I came up with, well, what do novice teachers want to know? They want to know practical things that work in their classroom. They want to know what uh, what obstacles did uh, veteran teachers overcome to stay positive, to stay in this profession? And then thirdly, they want to know, how do you take care of yourself? How, how, how can we manage our time, our boundaries uh, to be successful? So I framed the questions, went to my networks, and spread the word, who would be willing to share your secrets? with beginning teachers. I had no idea what I would get for responses, what the stories would be, and how I would frame it in a book. So it was clearly a very different kind of book for me. I had written three books before. I always knew what I was going to be writing. This one, I did not know what I was going to get back. And I was asking teachers to share their vulnerable moments. When did you learn something? about yourself as a teacher that you would be willing to share so that a novice teacher doesn't make that same mistake. Well, as you can guess, I got, I wanted 36 because I was doing this book 36 weeks of school. I got way more than that. And I was humbled by the honesty, the authenticity, the ways in which these veteran teachers and some beginning teachers that had only taught for a few years shared what it took to stay inspired in this very sometimes challenging profession. So this, uh, this wisdom that I'm going to talk about today is celebrating teachers' voices. And what I want, the, the point I want to make to, to all of us and remind us today, this is coming from inside of us. We get a lot of advice from outside, right? I can see you all nodding your heads. A lot of people are telling us what to do all the time. So why not have a book, a series, an inspirational guide that's from the inside, <laughs> the real stories of how we can be successful. So I'm hoping uh, this is going to inspire new, new teachers. And what I've noticed already from even people, the, the teachers in the book, the 36 teachers said they read the books and they are experienced teachers and they were inspired and refreshed to learn uh, these tips and ideas and learn from the stories. So. It's all about wisdom and it's our wisdom that I believe will make a difference. We're gonna throw that word wisdom around a lot today, Carol. Um, so why did you choose wisdom as a focus and how can teachers share their wisdom? So the thing about wisdom is, I, I think wisdom is how we grow as teachers. But we have to take a moment to reflect on what we're learning. So the definition of wisdom that's here in the screen, screen is it's that experience. It's the quality of the experience. It's our knowledge. It's our good judgment. It's the quality of being wise. That's a teacher. That's what teachers are doing every day in the classroom. So this sentence, listen to their words of wisdom, this book is about listening to the wisdom of the teachers who are in the classroom or in the field or teaching the teachers, any grade level. So we grow when we stop and pause and reflect on what's happening to us. So that's the experience part. Teachers are, we like to share. We like to talk. <laughs> That's our job. We're, we're talkers. We're sharers. But the way that this, um, this book evolved, I decided I wanted to be through stories so that when we tell each other stories, you know how you perk up when someone tells you a story, you're listening to that story instead of just giving us a list of uh, professional development tips and we have to try to memorize them in our in our heads. So when I framed the question to the teachers, I framed it uh, in the way that it would be a story. Now, my mentor, Roland Barth, was uh, when I was doing my doctor work, he 
inspired me so much because he believed in the power of teacher sharing. His book that I'm looking at my bookshelf called Improving Schools from Within, Teachers, Parents, and Principals Make a Difference. It's like we're the ones that make the difference. But here's the thing. We don't have time to share with each other. We are so busy sitting and getting in our professional development, I, and he used to call it sit and get, and or listening to the outside advice of others that we don't have a lot of time to reflect on what we're doing and what we're learning as we're teaching. And as he says here, when we articulate and reflect on our own craft knowledge, we make meaning of it and we learn. So the stories from these 36 teachers that I vetted and chose to put in this certain order um, are teachers who took the time to look at what happened and say, what did I learn from this? And how did this make me a better teacher? That's the next step. It isn't just the reflecting and the talking and the sharing and the complaining. We do talk and we do share. And that's not the wisdom part. The wisdom part is the next piece where we stop and listen and say, okay, what am I learning here? What, how did this experience challenge me as a teacher and help me grow? And how can I use this to reframe the decisions and the choices that I make? So, so that's a long answer. Megan, for, for what wisdom means to me. <laughs> no, I just love that. Um, let me ask you this. Why is it so important that experienced teachers share their wisdom now? Like, what is it about this time that we are oh, in? It just, gosh. There's a we, lot going on. <laughs> there's a lot going on. So here's the thing. We, we have to move more quickly because this is what's going on. Our teachers need help. Our novices are leaving. They're overwhelmed. They're tired. The veterans are saying, I'm tired too. I know that. <laughs> we're all tired and we're stressed. But think of coming into a profession and not having the skill set, if you're an experienced teacher, that, that we have. Like, we can do this. We, we don't have time to let these novices learn as they go. Like it used to be when I was a teacher, it was like, okay, you learn by your experiences, you fall down, you get up, you keep, and that's still gonna happen. But we need to accentuate the positive ways that these novices can get up to speed more quickly so that they can feel confident and competent in their role because we don't want them to leave. And this is why this book, the, the work that I'm doing in mentoring, um, this conversation, this webinar for us to even think about any of all of this is that we have to focus on bolstering the skills and the morale of those who are on the job. Because guess what? The cycle is they leave, we hire new people, we do it over again. Again, you're all nodding because we are seeing that happen in our schools. We can't, we don't have time. We have to do this now. We have to give our novices the answers, our secrets. We have to find ways to share what works in our classrooms and share. And actually, part of the vulnerable stories that that you'll read if you if you read the book, you'll you'll see the authenticity of how we overcome these challenges. That's what has to be taught, because the morale of us being successful. We stayed. I'm still doing this work, and as many of my friends that are I call them legacy teachers. We're retired. We could be off on a beach somewhere. And yes, we want to be. <laughs> but we, we want to give back. It's about paying it forward. So if you're on this call, you're on this call for a reason. You're on this webinar because you're committed to hearing the, the when I started teaching, I wish I had known. You're 
committed to giving that information to the next generation of teachers. I think there's an urgency around it, Megan. I, I think I think we need to really pay attention to that. Carol, there's a really lovely comment in the, the chat that says, we stayed. I love that. Oh, uh, yes. <laughs> and yes. And also one that says, we need to give our new teachers agency that yes. they are empowered to find strategies they can use. Yes. And we can give them some of those strategies and then empower them to create their own. We are the whole community. And I see this cycle and this this particular book with the 36 teacher voices as a celebration of what we know. It's a body of knowledge that's usually hidden. We usually let the researchers do this. This is this is public. I, I, I wanted to write this to make it visible. So so thank you for those comments and keep well, them coming. You you mentioned the utmost importance of sharing our stories with each other. Do you have a teaching moment story you can share to help kick us off today? Uh, I have so many stories, Megan. <laughs> and I, I have lots of stories in my teaching with light book too, um, because I, I do reflect on my stories and what I'm learning, but um, let me, sh I'm going to share one, but I also want to point out on the screen that this is the question of how I framed the story prompt for the teachers in the book. So, so my story, and you have stories, uh, it could be a challenging experience or sometime in your career, it could be a very successful experience in teaching. But where are our experiences that significantly change the way we think about ourselves as teachers? How do our experiences as teachers influence our decisions and the decisions we make as we move forward? So, so I'm going to share this one because it made a huge Im influence on, on my life as a teacher and why, why I'm still here. So here, here's a snapshot of a story. When I was, I had been teaching for about 18 years and I was invited to uh, go around the state. I lived in Massachusetts to share some practical strategies that I had learned in the classroom, a, a sabbatical, if you will. While I was on the sabbatical before it started, the school burned to the ground. I was an elementary teacher. So if you're elementary, you are gasping. Yes, all of my materials, every game, laminated, puzzle, everything was gone. I came back off the sabbatical and I was uh, assigned a portable classroom trailer in the back of the school. All my colleagues had, had already gotten back into other classrooms in a neighboring school. And I sobbed. I had no materials. I had desks from the high school that hadn't been used in decades. I had a class of 30 and I had just come off the highest point of my career, sharing, being a teacher leader into teaching, which I loved, but with nothing. Things that I had built up for 18 years in the classroom. And I was going to quit. I just, I couldn't do it. A friend came to me and she gave me this card. And on the front of the card, it said, bloom where you're planted. And I was like, oh my God, I don't know if I can bloom here. I, I just didn't know. And she gave me a pep talk. She mentored me. She said, you know, you're a good teacher. You have the passion. You love your students. You can do this. Focus on your strengths. So I focused on my strengths, got books from the library, did all what I needed to do. And um, the bottom line to the story is, it was the most successful year of teaching of my career in teaching. I got so close to those students. I discovered a student who couldn't read because I was very focused in this trailer. We were in there all day. <laughs> You couldn't even go out for recess in the snow. <laughs> and this student, Billy, touched my heart. I discovered he couldn't read. 
taught him how to read. And years later, he came to me and told me that he would never forget that year. He went to college and he became a teacher. And I have to tell you, even saying it now still kind of gives me goosebumps. And it touches our hearts, the work that we do as teachers and the influence that my mentor had on me not quitting that year. And it reshaped the way I looked at teaching, that it wasn't all the stuff. It was my relationship with my students, which I always had, but I didn't think of it that way. It was my inner compass telling me to stay and to focus on my strengths. And I stayed in teaching. And then I went on to do teacher training and get my doctorate. And that was a defining moment for me. That story changed me because then I knew I could teach anywhere. I was a teacher. I, we are teachers from inside. And our role at this time is to help these beginning teachers and to share our wisdom and to share that kind of a story so that they know that we have overcome challenges too. This is not the biggest challenge in the world, what we're going through now. We've all had challenges if you've been in the career for a while. So that's my story and it still touches <laughs> my heart because I know I wouldn't be here if I hadn't taken that moment to reflect and and see that I was a teacher and that I could, I could teach anywhere. So I'd like to ask all of you to just jot down on a piece of paper or in the chat or somewhere, you know the story, you know the moment. And it doesn't have to be a tragic one like this one, because I have others too that are more positive learning experiences. But like, when did you learn? That's the story I want you to find. Those are the stories we need to share, is finding the places that we experience a shift or an understanding or a knowledge that we make a difference as teachers. That's what our novice teachers need to hear. And that's what we need to say out loud. So thanks for asking that. <laughs> Whoa, I'm kind of... I just love that. Um, let's switch oh. gears for just a second. Um, the book is organized around four seasons of the school year, and it's not fall, winter, spring, summer, but what are these seasons? And can you talk a little bit about what each season means to you in terms of teaching? Thanks, Megan. So, so the way, so this is what happened. I got all of these fabulous stories <laughs> and vulnerable lessons and uh, information from, from more than the 36 teachers. And I wanted to organize, I just didn't want to lay it out as tips. So I looked at the school year, as we all do, when we as teachers like rituals and organizations and Monday to Friday and months and all that. But the seasons came, occurred to me because it's a rhythm. And the rhythm, these four kind of big rhythms are behaviors that we as teachers uh, use during these different times of the school year. So the first season, I just call it creating a community of learners. We're just getting started. And that's where many of you are right now. It's still October. We're getting started. We're creating a community of learners. Um, and one of the sample stories in the, in the, uh, in the book is Lisa Dix, and, and she's this new teacher. She has a memory of being a new teacher, and she goes in at the beginning of the year, and, and the veteran teachers don't want her to use her new ideas, and she gets, she gets stuck, and she doesn't know what to do, and, and her message there is trust your ideas. So as we're creating a community of learners, 
at the beginning, this whole season is getting to know our students and getting to know our colleagues and how we work with our colleagues. And I know a lot of teachers will say, I'd rather work with the kids than the colleagues. <laughs> because sometimes our colleagues are more challenging, and especially the novice teachers who are trying to gain entry. So that's that's why I called season one getting started for both like the first eight weeks of whenever the school year starts. The second season, I find uh, clustering the, the next eight weeks of school where we're gaining momentum, we've got everything going, we're, um, we're finding our own strengths, we feel good as novice teachers, uh, we think we can do something, <laughs> something well that we've learned in the first eight weeks. And a sample of one of those stories from Megan is making that human connection with each student. And sometimes what Megan tells is a story of having a student that she actually didn't like and she didn't know what to do. She's like, I know I'm supposed to like all these students, but to be honest, I'm just having a really hard time. And she shares the story of how she learned how to embrace and get to know a student that at first glance, she couldn't, couldn't uh, connect with. So this gaining momentum is finding our strengths, but it's also finding our students' strengths. So that's what I call season two. And that's kind of the next part of the year. The third season, this is the teaching season, and it goes on for weeks and weeks and weeks, like 16 weeks, I'd probably say. I have lots of stories in there. One sample is uh, Serena sharing how to make the work relevant. And this is the teaching season. It's no vacations, like we're just going to get to it, focus on teaching and learning. And a lot of the stories and the uh, practical tips relate to that, that time of year when we're really just doing the work. And the final season, I think is really one important season for, is when we end the school year and we have to intentionally think about how we want to close. And I purposefully in the book organize this to be six weeks, because usually we just want to end. It's the last day of school. We close the door. We're done. <laughs> and this this um, group of stories that I selected, because remember, I didn't know what I was going to get <laughs> from all of the wisdom, is uh, a teacher who shares an activity that she does at the end of every school year, where she has the students write a letter to the student that's going to be sitting in their seat next year. And they leave it on their desk. And she reads them all, of course. And what she learns from those letters is how she impacted the students in her class. And I believe this is a really important season, these last six weeks of school, where we celebrate and intentionally look at how we close our school year for our students and ourselves in an organized way instead of just shutting the door and moving on. So that's how I, I framed this advice and this wisdom so that novice teachers can look at it in a, a kind of a structured way and not just see 36 stories <laughs> in a book, but or clustered so that they can take in the wisdom weekly and absorb it and small bites and integrate it into their own lexicon, their own way of looking at at school. So thanks for asking me about that. I love this. Of course. You work with lots of mentors and novice teachers. What is the one thing that novice teachers tell you is the most challenging issue they're trying to tackle? Ah, well, I'm, I know what it is, hands down, <laughs> what I hear. But before I say it, anyone who wants to put it in the chat, what they think it is, let's see. What's how, the hardest thing for a new teacher to yeah, tackle? Yeah, what would it, yeah, so what would they say? Oh, what would you like help in? What, what would a novice teacher say if 
we ask that question. Can, is anything popping oh, up? Oh, lots is popping up, Carol. Oh, what's popping up? I'm not going to um, I'll tell you what my, we'll see. We'll see how it matches. Let's I'm give seeing a minute. Behaviors. I'm seeing mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. classroom management. Mm -hmm. I'm seeing mm -hmm. motivation. Mm -hmm. um, lots of management. First mm -hmm. day of school, getting students to turn their work in. Mm -hmm. How to build relationships with students. Oh, parent involvement. Mm. Classroom management, time in all caps with lots of explanations. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Oh, you guys are good. You guys are great. Yes, I love great it. answers. Getting I all the papers it. turned in. Yes. Survival. Yes. Oh God, keep them coming. Oh, I being can see heard them. by our peers. That's a good one. Ooh, I love that one. Time management. Okay, so now they want to see my answer so put yes, my slide up and let's okay. see how it matched up well hands think, down this i is think the one we're on i think we're list. on the right <laughs> i think we're on the same page everyone <laughs> so that's what they would always say to me what i want to kind of tease out a little bit for all of us and you were you were bringing it up in the different ways it's the time management i don't have time uh I like to add this one in. No one said this one, but space. It's this classroom space and the way we organize and manage our space. So some of my teacher friends could have junk everywhere. Their desk is all piled up. They could still find that piece of paper, but the classroom maybe was disorganized or whatever. And then some teachers have everything. Everything's in their place, like a kindergarten teacher has all the sections organized. And then we have routines, we have rituals. And then students is what I mean about the student behavior. How do we manage that? So guess what? Classroom management is a huge topic and when we talk about that and in this uh this book when i when i started teaching i wish i had known i asked all these experienced teachers to give one classroom management tip so they folded that in with their story and there are some excellent ones so i'm going to give you a few just get a teaser from the book so one teacher said what she likes to do is practice the routines to show the students about handing in their papers or where the papers go or organizing all that paperwork and she does role plays with the students so i remember doing that as well so it's fun to do a role play this is how you do it and you practice it and guess what you have to keep practicing it even now for the first eight weeks of school it can't be just a list of rules on the board because we all know nobody's looking at that so it has to be seen and verb, uh, visualized uh, one way i did the role play is and the kids students loved it any age would love it especially those junior high students is what not to do so what it doesn't look like <laughs> so let's pass in the papers not this way and they would be silly and they would, you know, really um, ham it up. And everybody got the idea of the routine and ritual. Another uh, tip that came through in from one of the uh, experienced teachers was taking a photo of the students and putting them up on the wall and having each student write an, uh, uh, a bio or taking their first name and writing something that they liked, if their name's Adam, what, a word that related to them. So these classroom management things, it's broad. It isn't just behavior management. But when novice teachers say classroom management, a lot of times that's what they mean is their students. So these types of ideas, we have to tease out. That's wisdom because we want the things that work. We want to share these classroom management tips with the novices at our school and with each other too. So, so thanks for asking that, clarifying it. Okay, Carol, we're getting close to where we might have some time left for questions. Good. What wisdom would you like to leave us with today? Okay, so I have mostly been working in the last couple books on well being, teacher well being looking at the whole teacher and seeing us 
as that human being. Sometimes the students don't know that we're human. They think we sleep at school if they see us outside. But the message of taking care of ourselves. And this profession is, it is challenging, but I love it. I loved teaching even when I had all the tough stories and I was born to be a teacher. I know it and I'm supporting teachers and take paying it forward now as a legacy teacher to, to help teachers thrive. That's what we want to do. But to do that, to be the best versions of ourselves, we have to take care of ourselves. So a big piece of this, when I started teaching book project, is having each teacher share how they have not just survived, but how they thrive, how they take care of themselves. And it's so interesting to, to read the words of experience and, and notice that teachers, teachers who are successful do have boundaries. They're not coming in and working themselves to death like we see some of these new teachers. We have to have the boundaries. Thank you for the hearts. You're getting lots of hearts. Yes. <laughs> and these boundaries are time related. So some of the teachers are putting um, their time or on their phone and just saying, I leave at four o'clock, whatever the time is, I'll stay for this and put the buzzer on and then just leave. We'll never get it all done. We never get it done. We know this, but we have to educate the younger or new, I shouldn't say younger because we have a lot of career changers as well the newest teachers are vulnerable and they think if they're working harder and taking more bags of papers home and that that is going to make them a better teacher and it isn't and we know that if you're a successful teacher and you have that boundary so you can be happy in front of the kids the next day so lots of suggestions well what a theme that shows up in the in the book is about moving and keeping uh, the students moving. So this here's the thing, this message, our well-being relates to teacher and student success. We're not going to be successful as teachers if we don't focus on our own boundaries, our own lives, finding joy in our life and I know you, it's tough to have a work-life balance. We, we know that maybe there's not such a thing, but we can create a life outside of school or a way to pause and take a breath or lift our hands up over our heads and just take a stretch. And this all has to be intentional. Megan said, uh, mentioned that I was a yoga teacher. I did uh, complete my yoga teacher training and I thought I was gonna be a yoga teacher when I retired. And here I am still working with my teachers, <laughs> groups and writing, because what I ended up doing is integrating what I was learning in yoga to create well-being for teachers. So I encourage all of you that are listening um, to think about these mindful actions. And as we model, if you're an experienced teacher, we have to model this so that they see us creating the boundaries. They see us um, pausing. And the other thing that's really important for me is focusing on the positive and the gratitude piece. And even at the end of the day, when we've had horrible days of challenges and all kinds of stuff, to keep that light. So Ella Baker says, give light and people will find the way. So if we are giving light to our novice teachers, if we're taking a moment to find the wisdom inside of ourselves, and the learning 
from the most challenging situations, we will all find a way and we will find a way to help our novice teachers be successful and help them stay in school, uh, stay in the profession and contribute to educating our next generation of students. And I believe in this and I believe in, and I'm so grateful to all of you for being here because it takes time away from whatever you had to do. And this shows me that you are so committed to, to serving and, and helping others. So I, I'm, I'm just so grateful. So keep the light, keep the light on. We want to keep the light on. <laughs> Absolutely. Those are my final thoughts. Thanks, Megan. Well, thank you so much, Carol. Um, just looking at the time, it looks like we've got a couple of minutes for some questions. If anyone does have a question or a comment you want to share, um, please feel free to shoot those into the into the chat right now, and we can go through them if we'd like. I have seen some really great, amazing comments, so thank you so much for being engaged and involved and sharing with us today. There's been some really beautiful things in the comments. Let's see here. Any questions that I see? Oh, Nancy Jacobson said, I love the light you just sent to me. <laughs> oh, Nancy, keep your light going too. Be the light. And Delmano Mitchell says, I tell all my new teachers to shine and not let their lights go out. Oh, Focusing on gratitude. Let's see. Um, Kristen Graham says, don't give homework. Have intervention time during the day instead as a helpful tip. Love that. Love that. Oh, they're coming in fast and furious now. I can't read fast enough. <laughs> I can see some of them. The name on the book, somebody asked. When I started teaching, I wish I had known. Weekly Wisdom for Beginning Teachers. Oh, there's a question about how to buy the book. That's a wonderful question. I'm happy to help answer that. Yay. <laughs> I'll save that one. Let's give some discounts. <laughs> there are a couple of other questions, but stay tuned. I have the answer okay. to that one. Okay, good. Let's see. Can I Thanks, add Angie. the link for the Monday webinar into the chat? I will try to do that quickly before we sign off here. Um, Though I do believe it will be included in that follow-up email that you'll receive. So if I don't get a chance to do that here, um, it will definitely come in that email. Um, Andrew asks, how do we shift the narrative from we are too overworked, underpaid, time poor to something more positive? Well, that's that's what this webinar is attempting to do. So it is, here's the thing. This book for me, writing this and teaching with light, the other one that I that I wrote that's on teacher well-being, is an attempt to balance the rhetoric because whenever we we do need to shift it. And I think these types of conversations and just the platform that Corwin has given me to share this uh, this book and this point of view is how it starts. And it starts with the stories. I like it through the stories. You can all shift it. You just need to uh, find your teaching story that's where you were vulnerable or learned something. That's the shift. Because my horrible story about the school burning down could have had a very different, I could have quit. I didn't because uh, there was a shift in that story that, that changed the trajectory of my career and my and my life so so these kinds of conversations and mindful intentional living will will shift I, I believe that I do I wouldn't be doing this so thank you for that question anyone else I just have to share Amanda's comment she says I start every day out with animal yoga poses that way we can let out our roars and our growls and get out our morning feelings so we can focus on the day. 
I, love I think that's that. amazing. I want to do that. I'm going to do that. That's great. That's fantastic. <laughs> Thank you for sharing, Amanda. Thanks, Amanda. That's so great. I can see Helena saying something about relationships. Yep. Sharing stories and relationships. Yes. Yes. Um, can you, Carol, can, Greta has a great question. Will the techniques and ideas in the book work for middle and high school teachers too? Absolutely. All teachers. And actually what I have, um, when, when you get the book, you'll see that there's a pause, reflect and act after every story. And there are ways that this book can be used as a book club where teachers could read it together. So that is a way to shift the language in a school and the school culture when teachers are uh, sharing their stories with each other in a systematic way. And actually, Megan can uh, send the Appendix B piece, but the, the seven ways to support beginning teachers using this book. It's part of the end of the book. Um, but what we discovered is that the experienced teachers got a lot out of the, out of the book. We wrote it for we wrote it exclusively in the beginning for beginning teachers. But what we found is everybody wanted to be refreshed and get some new ideas. And that's uh, this this as a book club is is a perfect book because there are places to uh, document your thinking and what's worth celebrating. There are questions that go with each story. So it's, it's really, it's really lovely. You're, 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 you're going to really enjoy it. Yeah, it reminds me of, I, I just have to, to say that when you were talking at the beginning about paying it forward, um, I just seeing the comments here and everyone being so engaged, like you all have so much to offer and so much experience. And I hope that you take that and you share it with all your coworkers and your other teachers, because there's so many wonderful things happening here. I can only imagine what wonderful things are happening in your classrooms. So thank yes. you for engaging with us today and sharing your, your thoughts. And I, I saw um, one comment about the um, department chairs and any school leaders. This is a jumping off point for inviting people to share. And the way to build relationships and have people get to know each other is when they, when they share their stories. And it doesn't have to be, as I said, a tragic one. We have funny stories, too. I think we need to bring some humor back into our conversations. And 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 that shifts um, the way in which we approach our teaching and bring more joy back into our conversations and our, our work with students. But w one of the funnier stories I have when, when you see it is this teacher wrote a story and I titled it, When You Fall Down, Get Back Up. <laughs> and this is Melissa Carr. And she'd I been teaching <laughs> for 32 years. And she just like really literally did fall down off a chair. And all the kids started laughing. And she started laughing. And um, it things happen in schools. And we need to talk about those two because it's fun. It is fun <laughs> to be a teacher. Absolutely. <laughs> Right. Well, I think we do need to wrap up, but thank you again, Carol. And thank you to everyone for joining us today. Um, I have just a couple more slides to get through real quickly. Um, I hope you'll check out Carol's new podcast, Teacher to Teacher. We've just launched this here at Corwin. Um, and each episode, Carol brings two experienced educators together um, to talk about a theme and go through some strategies and share their wisdom um, and offer the best advice they can for new and early teachers. So I hope you'll check that out. And I just want to mention in this podcast, the three teachers that I cited, three out of the four teachers on the slides and the seasons are on the podcasts. So you will actually hear teachers from this book. 
It's really awesome. And I encourage you, I just created and designed a new idea called Podcast PD, where teachers who listen to all 10 episodes get PDP credit or whatever you do in your state, get hourly um, credit for putting on your headphones, taking a walk and listening to a podcast and then filling out a journal. So if you are interested in that kind of um, professional development, you can email me. Can they email me? How can I, can people get to me somehow? Let me give uh, them my email. I'll yeah, give you my why email. Don't you share your email. I will that. share. So my email is mentoringinaction at gmail.com. And that'll come right to me mentoring in action at gmail.com if you want to have a follow-up or you have another question or you want to learn how you can uh, create a podcast pd listening to teachers or a book club with this book i have all kinds of stuff and free free information on my website which i will link you to if you email me sounds good thank you carol and just to highlight the books that carol had mentioned these are her other books if you're looking for more teacher wisdom and some mentoring advice. You can find that here. So thank you, Carol. It's always lovely. Thank you to everyone for joining us and be safe. Enjoy the rest of your week and have a good day, night, morning, wherever you're coming yes. from. <laughs> Thanks, Megan. Thanks for being a thank great Thank you, everyone. Host. Thanks, everyone.